Good morning. Thanks for watching our digital service. Isn't watching or listening at home great? If you don't like a song, you can fast forward. If the sermon gets boring, you can pour another cup of coffee. You can watch in your pajamas. But we do miss seeing you, and I bet you miss seeing your friends. We are at a point where some may stay at home, must, some may stay away because they're concerned about the virus. Others are watching because they're traveling during the summer. A few watch from Brazil, Indiana, and Virginia. We also understand why you can't come. We have a prayer as we prepare these services, that God will renew your soul. Maybe it will be a song, possibly a prayer, or even a few words in the sermon that revive your spirit. Thanks for coming and welcome to the worship of the living God. A long time ago, there was a man who laid down his life on the line. He claimed he could make the lame walk again and give back the sight to the blind. Oh, now some people loved him. Some people wanted to take him and put him away. Well, I wasn't there to see what he did. But if he were right here today, I would crawl all the way to the river. I would crawl all the way to the sea. Just to watch him walk on the water And lay his loving hands on me A carpenter by trade But the kingdom that he made Was built without hammer and nails It stands like a rock Through the ages of time It was built with love that never failed Oh, I've read in the good book that someday he's coming and some say it ain't far away. But the day that he stands on the banks of the Jordan, this sinner will be on his way. I would crawl all the way to the river. I would crawl all the way to the sea just to watch him walk on the water and lay his loving hands on me I would crawl all the way to the river I would crawl all the way to the sea just to watch him walk on the water and lay his loving hands on me. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you on this day in the midst of chaos, a world that moves so rapidly, a world that seems so erratic. Bring us back to a pace and a rhythm that your light guides on the pathways that we walk. May we soak in your word on this morning to guide us on the path that you lead. We continue to pray for our British brothers and sisters as they mourn. We continue to pray for the Ukraine and all victims of war and violence. We continue to pray for our community, nation, and world. God, you know each and every needs of each and every situation. Give us the strength, courage, and wisdom to speak to the needs from the end of the street to the all ends of the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Our scripture today is from Luke 18, 9 through 14, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Today we begin with just a, a bit of a lesson about biblical literature. There's a variety of kinds of literature in the Bible. Think of the Bible sort of like a, a library. You go to the library, there's a fiction section, nonfiction, biography, poetry, children's literature. Well, in the Bible, you have uh, various types of literature. One is poetry. And you read biblical poetry. Well, you read biblical poetry the way you would read any poetry. Poetry is meant to elicit a feeling to bring forward an emotion. Uh, sometimes the words that, that a psalmist or a poet uses are not to be taken literally. My bones were crushed within me. Well, the psalmist is not saying that their bones were literally crushed. They're saying that when they refused to repent, that it felt like their bones were crushed. But there's also history in the Bible. Uh, history in the Bible is not always easy to identify, but sometimes it just is glaringly easy. Like in the year that King Uzziah died. You know, when you have some sort of reference to a historical figure or a historical place and time, you can date things. And so you know that that's history. Uh, and Peter preached at the temple. Well, we know there was a Peter and we know there was a temple. And so we have a historical reference. But there's also parable in the Bible. Now, a parable in the Bible uh, is meant to e open our eyes, okay? Parables like the one that we're reading today are sometimes introduced by Jesus by saying, and he spoke to them in this parable. But sometimes Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't introduce it that way. And while it's not foolproof, a, a good way to be able to distinguish parable from non-parable is with the details. If a parable doesn't give you a place and time. A father had two sons, okay? Doesn't tell you the names of the sons, doesn't tell you where this farm was, just the father has two sons. Well, that's a good clue that that's a parable. It's just sort of an introductory remark that gives you an idea of a general place and a general location and time and people. And so uh, parables are well, they provide us less details most of the time. There's a few that provide us more details. But those are three types of biblical literature. Which brings us to the actual parable we're looking at today. It's a very interesting story. It's found in Luke's gospel. And Luke uses Jesus' material here. And so I really want us to concentrate on the idea that there are two audiences. The first audience is the the actual original hearers of Jesus' story. The second audience is the way that Luke blends it into his material. Now, Jesus' audience on that day, when he tells this parable, would have been mostly Hebrews, maybe exclusively Hebrews. Peasants, working people, maybe a tax collector in the bunch. But these would have been people like uh, his disciples, his closest friends, a crowd of people that were... Uh, you know, drawn to him, all right? And most of them would have been Hebrew in their background. Uh, Luke, on the other hand, is writing to a young movement uh, trying to form itself, a church that's probably getting persecuted a little bit. And so his audience is not Hebrew, his audience is Greek, his people are not necessarily tax collectors, 
Um, they might even be a few wealthy folks inside of Luke's readers, all right? So those are the two broad groups that Luke is trying to write to here and that Jesus is speaking to in the original place, all right? Now, Jesus was not one to allow for bullying. If he had sensed that the Pharisees were bullying others, or even if there was bullying among his own disciples, Jesus would speak up and probably address that. And so he had a, a real ear for bullying, braggadocious attitudes, haughty spirits. Now, everybody listening to Jesus on that day was likely, as I said a moment ago, a peasant. There was certainly a Jew. There were some serious religious folks in the mix. So with that in mind, let's turn our modern ears towards this brief parable. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Keep in mind, parable, parable, parable. There is wisdom in this. It is not a story with a single moral. It's a story meant to open our eyes to see differently. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, two men going to pray, not unusual. At this point, neither one is better than the other. Both have arrived at the temple to speak to God. Being that they were at the temple, it's likely that they were both Jewish. Now, the temple courts did allow for women, did allow for Gentiles, but I'm just going to sort of believe that in Jesus' mind, he has these two men going to pray. One being a Pharisee, he's certainly a Jew. And the other being a tax collector, is probably still a Jew. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Thieves. Rogues adulterers, or even this tax collector over here. Now, the opening four words are thanks. Now, obviously his thanks looks like he's looking down on other people. But he seems grateful. Grateful to not be a thief grateful to not be like other people. Maybe he does recognize that he has been blessed. I fast twice a week, he prays. I give a tenth of my income. <laughs> Do we really need to share our resume with God when we're praying? Oddly enough, I would imagine that the fishermen and the housekeepers who are listening to this would not find this a shocking prayer. We find it a little bit shocking, but I don't think the original hearers found it that shocking. Now we hear it and we go, we stop in our tracks and said, did he say that? <laughs> and we mean, would we use prayer to tell God our resume? But the original folks that heard it were likely impressed. I mean, he tithes fast twice a week. Now remember, they haven't read the parable. They're hearing the parable, and there's a difference. And as they hear it, and as it's being unfolded, you know, you're not so sure this is the villain or not. I mean, after all, this is, wouldn't everybody who is religious want to be a person who tithed and fasted? And so maybe this is the hero of the parable. Maybe this is the guy that Jesus wants us to model our life after. Because after all, I mean, he does tithe. And he does fast. The original audience was hearing it, not reading it. And reading allows us a little bit of a liberty to withhold our emotions until the end. Hearing gives us real time feelings. And the first one that we feel here is maybe Jesus would like us to be like this fellow. But there's more. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, 
but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, there could have been a tax collector in the crowd. But most everyone in the crowd would not have a great deal of respect for the tax collector. So when they heard the profession, the tax collector, they would be more inclined at this point to think that the first character was the role model, not the second character. But he has this prayer, God be merciful. And that actually would be the sentiment of most of the crowd. It's odd. Most of the crowd probably longs to be as committed as the Pharisee who would fast twice a week and who would tithe. But in reality, because they're so close to poverty, they can't, they wouldn't normally fast at that close to poverty, and they don't have the time or the willingness or the money to tithe. And so they find themselves being more like the second man. They long to be like the first man thus far, but the second man is actually who they are. Their lives are in disarray, and all they do is beat their chest and say, God, be merciful to me. They know that they're sinful. The crowd, at this point, is likely to respect the Pharisee for their piety, but identify more with the <laughs> tax-collecting sinner. The Pharisee may have been the ideal, but the tax collector was their reality. Now, I would imagine that if I'm hearing this the first time, sitting in the audience of Jesus, at this point, I haven't chosen, I haven't even been asked to choose a favorite. I've just heard a story, a good story so far, about two people praying and two different ways of praying. But there is a bit more. Jesus always saves the clincher for the end of the story. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Boy, their eyes opened. Their eyes opened. God is not looking for the person who fasts twice a week or the person who brags about tithing. God is looking for that person who is humble enough to know exactly who they are and humble enough to admit that to God. That those who are exalted will be brought down and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is making an argument that the first sign of devotion to God is humility. Humility is a valued part of the Jesus curriculum. The ability to see ourselves in need of grace. The ability to see others as our equals. And the ability to see all people as our family. In the Gospel of John, it's written, Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded. It's a story of God's Son willing to wash feet. Later, Paul, speaking of Christ, writes, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. You see, Jesus didn't just teach humility. He practiced it. He lived it. It was a part of who he was and a part of who he wants us to be. Remember the very beginning of this parable? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. regarded others with contempt. But now remember the ending, the last words. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who are humble will be exalted. 
Humans like us have no business holding anyone in contempt. <laughs> the server, the lawyer, the poor, the sick, the wealthy, the person who avoids church, the person who is old. We're just pilgrims trying to finish another week. We are better off being humble. Actually, it's always better to be humble than to be humbled. These are the words of the Lord. Our benediction this morning. Just as you are, come. Be open to God's invitation. No matter if you have been hurt, feel empty, or feel like a failure. No matter if you are having workplace issues, financial hardships, living with someone, or divorced. No matter if you're experiencing career pressures, a crisis of faith, or mental struggles. Come, just as you are.